Hello folks, Scott Phillips here and welcome to my channel. Today we are bound for fantasy with a look back at Fritz Leiber's first published story ever, Two Sot Adventure, which first appeared in the August 1939 issue of Unknown Magazine, edited by John W. Campbell Jr. And it's also the first story that he published featuring his very popular sword and sorcery characters, Fafford and the Grey Mauser. So in this video, I'm going to look back a little bit on how he came to write those characters and those stories, and then uh, look at that very first story and some of the artwork that uh, came out with it that gave us our very first look at how Fafford and the Grey Mauser might look <laughs> based on uh, the stories. And uh, also, I should say that this is my entry to the first week of a BookTube event, February Fantasy Stories, which was uh, inaugurated last year by the Bookish Bryants. And I understand they would have been back this year to host it again, but uh, unfortunately, as I understand it, they are experiencing some uh, homeowner challenges this winter with some uh, burst pipes and some uh, maybe some structural damage, things like that, that they're trying to take care of so they can get back into the house during this uh, particularly cold winter here. Uh, but in the meantime, Steve Donahue over at his channel has picked up the baton to host February Fantasy Stories for 2023. And uh, I'll leave a link to his announcement uh, for that down below. Uh, but uh, the strange thing to me seems that even though he did announce this a couple of weeks ago, and we're a week into February already, I have not seen anybody posting any February Fantasy Stories videos yet. So, and I'm usually kind of late to the party on some of these things. I haven't been doing these booktube uh, videos myself for very long, uh, so I'm enjoying joining in, but I, right now, so far, I feel a little like a tree in the forest kind of thing, and I'm hoping that others will join the fray soon. Uh, now, I know that uh, Steve Donahue has a number of uh, February uh, reading projects going on, uh, and so uh, uh, this might be getting kind of lost in the in the juggling a bit, perhaps. But hoping that uh, people do join in soon. And uh, there are uh, actually four weeks for it here, this being the first one. And uh, again, I'll link to Steve's video down below where he outlines what those four prompts are for the for the month of February for fantasy reading. Not that you have to follow it; they're just. Uh, 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 not even guidelines, but just uh, uh, some themes that you might want to look into to kind of give your February fantasy reading some uh, diversity. But for the first week, he suggests swords and sorcery. So that particular subgenre of fantasy is what we're talking about today and why, uh, why we're going to uh, chat a little bit about uh, Fafford and the Grey Mouser. Then week two is going to be epic fantasy. <clears throat> and week three will be... Uh, He's calling it an installment, and it might be uh, one book or story out of a larger series that maybe you've been working through and have uh, set aside for a while and want to get back to. So you might be jumping into the middle of uh, a fantasy series, perhaps. Uh, and then the fourth and final week is for contemporary fantasy, and uh, I think he said possibly urban fantasy. Uh, now, you don't have to follow any of the prompts necessarily, but... Uh, uh, as long as you read fantasy sometime during the during the month, then you are uh, considered being involved and uh, having a good time with uh, whoever else might be joining us doing this. So, uh, without further ado, let's uh, get on with uh, talking about uh, Fritz Leiber's first story, uh, Two Sot Adventure, and uh, uh, Fafford and the Grey Mauser. But first, let's take a look back at Fritz Leiber himself. Fritz Leiber was born in 1910 in Chicago, and when he first started writing, he wrote under the name Fritz Leiber Jr., because his father, Fritz Leiber Sr., uh, had already made a bit of a name for himself in the theater. He was a Shakespearean actor, and uh, also appeared <clears throat> in a number of films of the day. And when Leiber was 16, he read his first H.P. Lovecraft horror story, The Color Out of Space, in the September 27 issue of amazing stories. Now, at that time, uh, Leiber had already been enjoying reading a lot of the exciting science fiction stories in Amazing, but Lovecraft's story was so bleak to him 
that it reportedly depressed him for weeks and it put him off reading the magazine. Now, by 1932, Leiber was attending the University of Chicago and through a new circle of friends that he was meeting there, he got reintroduced to Lovecraft and really got into it and uh, followed Lovecraft's new horror stories as they were coming out uh, into the 1930s, and he became a major influence for Leiber in his writing. Uh, around the same time, there was a bit of a turning point. He met uh, someone who was to become one of his best friends through life, uh, Harry Otto Fisher. And uh, those two guys, uh, their friendship really got some of uh, Leiber's creative juices going as far as writing. In 1934, it was actually Fisher who came up with the idea for Fafford and the Grey Mauser, and he imagined it in a fully inhabited magical world that was based a bit on Celtic folklore at the time. And uh, he based the character of Fafford and the Grey Mauser on uh, Liber and himself. Uh, it was, uh, Liber was a lot taller than Fisher, so uh, he cast Liber as the tall barbarian Fafford, and himself as the short mercenary thief, the Grey Mauser. So these two college pals would get together and knock around ideas and concepts for stories and adventures based, based on themselves and, and these characters that they'd come up with. Now, this was during the Depression, so economies were kind of tight, and there was a big fashion of board games that was sweeping the country then because it was kind of a cheaper form of entertainment, and they were really catching on, games like Monopoly and Sorry and Scrabble, for instance. So uh, they actually took their idea of Fafford and the Grey Mauser and invented their own avatar-based board game, and they called it Lankmar, uh, which is the, uh, the, the country that is uh, the setting for a lot of the uh, Fafford and Grey Mauser stories. And this was years before anything like Dungeons and Dragons had come along. So, inspired by the characters they'd come up with and the adventures that they were playing around with for their board game, and Liber had gotten back into reading weird tales by now pretty regularly and was really enjoying the stories of Robert E. Howard in that magazine, uh, he started thinking that maybe he could write his own short stories based on uh, the adventures that he and Fisher had been playing around with uh, with that board game. So in 1935, he started writing stories of Fafford and the Grey Mauser and submitted them to Weird Tales. Uh, but he wasn't having much luck with that. Weird Tales wasn't really interested and didn't buy any of them. But then uh, in 1939, John W. Campbell Jr., who had been editing astounding stories for uh, a little while by then, uh, a science fiction magazine that we've talked quite a bit about on this channel here, he started to publish a new magazine that was a lot more in the same lines as Weird Tales, and he called it Unknown, and it featured or focused mostly on fantasy-type stories. So Liber took a chance with Campbell and Unknown and sent in uh, some manuscripts, and Campbell bought Two Sought Adventure for the August 1939 issue of Unknown, and then Liber was off to the races with that. It's the story of Fafford and the Grey Mauser teaming up here to seek a fortune in jewels that are hidden somewhere in a castle-like structure on the outskirts of Lankmar. And somehow, uh, the Grey Mauser has gotten a hold of a page that he cut out of an ancient tome that described exactly what these jewels are like, the size of them, and uh, exactly where they're hidden and how to get there. But it has a warning saying that uh, there's no one standing guard there, really, and uh, uh, there are no booby traps involved or anything, but there's been something protecting it, and it, that's the one thing we don't know is what's protecting it. It's 300 years old now, and so their feeling is that, well... We have a clear description on how to get there and where to look for it and exactly what it is. So we're going to go for it. And anything that was set up 300 years ago can't possibly be still in effect now. So we're just going to go and, and uh, loot this thing for ourselves and, and, uh, and, and move on. But uh, then it's a, a series of adventures along the way, the people they come across and all. And once they get to the treasure house, they are uh, uh, 
finding just nothing but the shattered bones of fortune seekers that have come before them. Now, it's a lot of fun to read this story. And uh, it's, like I said, it's, it's Liber's first story. So it does have its flaws. And one of them, I think, although it's not a major one at all, it's still a, a, a romp to read, as many of the uh, Faffer and Gray Mauser stories are for me, a lot of fun. But I kept asking the question, they, they, as, as they're on their adventure here, their quest, they're finding out that a lot of the treasure seekers that have come before them also had very clear directions and instructions and, and uh, everything on how to find the treasure. And my question reading it, and the answer might be in there somewhere, and I've just either forgotten it or missed it somehow, but if it was so well hidden and protected and and valuable by uh, uh, this person who had set this all up, why are there all these clues that everybody can get in order to find it? It just seems uh, odd that it, it was it something about the, uh, the, the treasure is actually luring them for some reason? I, I don't think the story ever answers that question, and it might not really be an issue. Uh, it certainly isn't as far as reading the story and enjoying it, but um, that's kind of the the uh, impetus of the story there, what, what gets them going. Now, one of the really engaging things that I felt about this story was towards the end, and don't worry, no spoiler alert involved here. It doesn't really have anything to do with, uh, with the outcome of the story or anything. It's more Liber's writing style that he uses during this one scene here. And all through the story, uh, Fafford and the Grey Mauser have been working together, obviously, through this through this whole adventure here. And uh, now, towards the end of the story, they're having to kind of split up uh, for a particular reason. And uh, it starts where they're working together, and at one point, the Grey Mauser leaves Fafford to continue working on what they've been doing while he goes out to see what's going on outside the treasure house and decides that he's going to have to come to the aid of this young girl who they met earlier in their adventures. And she had helped them, so now he wants to help her. But the writing style now is they've kind of split the two tasks that they're doing. And yet, it doesn't jump from, well, it does jump from one scene to another, paragraph by paragraph. So it's not talking about what uh, Fafford is doing uh, in one section, and then it switches scenes entirely to follow the Grey Mauser. Instead, one paragraph talks about what Fafford is doing, and then the next paragraph is what the Mauser's doing, and then Fafford and the Mauser. Just one paragraph after another. So when you're reading it, you really get a feeling like these two things are happening simultaneously. It doesn't talk about Fafford, and then he does his thing, and then moves over to uh, the Grey Mauser, and he's handling his portion of the story, and then they meet up later. It's just a simultaneous thing, and it seems like that style might be distracting, but it isn't at all. It just reads right along very fluidly, and you really get that sense of kind of watching two different uh, uh, storylines at the same time, and uh, very engaging. So uh, if you've read any Fafford and the, Fafford and the Grey Mauser, by the way, I Look this up. It's Fafford, not Fafford. <laughs> Fafford and the Grey Mauser. Uh, if you've read any of those stories before and you haven't read this one, uh, it's a little bare bones as far as a lot of the other later stories go, but uh, very fun to read, and uh, I would uh, recommend it. And uh, maybe now that you have some of the background of how it, it came to be written, uh, it might be a little more fun as well. But now, like I usually like to do, let's take a look at some of the artwork that appeared in this first story. Like a lot of these debut stories, Tucson Adventure did not make the cover, so we did not get a full-color painting of anything in the story. But it did get three really nice pen and ink interior illustrations by Filipino artist M. Isop, including this title page. And this gives us our very first look ever of Fafford himself battling a ne'er-do-well, a ruffian that he and the Grey Mauser have come across early in their adventure here. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we don't see the Grey Mauser, but he is within the frame of the page here. He's actually hanging from a tree branch up above the action, and that's his sword that we can see coming down from behind the lettering, uh, stabbing the 
the bad guy there in the shoulder. Now, uh, I think it's a really nice illustration. I love, I love M. Isop's pen and ink work <clears throat> in all these illustrations, but there's just one thing in it that isn't quite right. And I don't know if we can really fault M. Isop for it at this point, but it's just really, it's a matter of scale. And Fafford is usually described as being very tall, almost seven feet tall. I don't think that his height is specifically mentioned in the story. So we can maybe uh, forgive uh, uh, Mr. Isop uh, a little bit here. But really, uh, Fafford should be towering over his opponent there. The second illustration is our first look at both Fafford and the Grey Mauser together. And this is depicting a scene where they're riding through the forest just outside the edge of Lankmar. And uh, again, we don't really get a sense of that tremendous size difference between the two of them. Uh, Fafford in the foreground here does look larger uh, compared to the Grey Mauser, but it looks like it's more of a perspective thing than anything else. But uh, they're old friends here on an adventure together for the first time that we are able to read about it. And uh, it's uh, the part of the scene that is being depicted here is they are just starting to realize that there are more treasure maps out there. And so, again, they mention it in the story here, so they're kind of calling attention to it, and I don't recall that that ever gets answered. It may, may very well have been addressed later in the story. I just have either missed it or, or forgotten it, but it uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, you still got to read the story to enjoy it, and uh, it's uh, just fun all the way through. And then finally here is another great use of the black and white, just that contrast of the deep blacks of the backgrounds of the cavernous interior of the treasure house. And uh, we are seen here being confronted by the priest. And this guy has been living in the treasure house for decades. And he believes that he knows the secret of the house and that it won't hurt him because he is not, so he proclaims, he's not interested in getting the jewels for himself. Uh, he's just living in there uh, peacefully, and uh, he's not guarding the jewels or anything himself, but uh, uh, he does convey some information and uh, is uh, integral to the uh, uh, resolution of the story here. Now, I always like to talk about the artist or artists that we look at in my videos here because I feel that they're often overlooked. A lot of booktubers will, will definitely talk about the books and stories that they're chatting about and also quite often the authors. But I feel that uh, the artists don't get the attention that they really deserve and they are contributors to the stories in a lot of ways. They help us to visualize things that, if it's just text, that uh, we don't really have that benefit in a lot of cases. So um, let's take a look at M. Isop here real quick. Now, unfortunately, I was not able to find a portrait of the artists anywhere online, which I like to show when I'm giving a little uh, biographical background on, but uh, in lieu of that, instead, uh, I'll just put up uh, kind of a little gallery of some of his best work, so you can, while we're chatting about his background, you can kind of get a sense of his style and talent. Manuel Ray Isop was born in 1904 in the Philippines, and he and his younger brother, Pogsalong Ray Isop, uh, they grew up both wanting to become rich and famous Filipino artists. And I talked a little bit about uh, Pogsalong, younger brother, in an earlier video about Robert Heinlein's Lifeline. He was the illustrator for that uh, short story. And I'll leave a link to that down below if you're interested in that. But uh, Manuel left the Philippines in 1925 and he worked his passage on a ship to British Columbia and then... Uh, went down to Seattle to get into the United States. And then from there, he moved to Washington Heights in Manhattan. And once he was there, he started drawing portraits for newspapers and uh, illustrations for movie posters for 20th Century Fox and Columbia Pictures. And then eventually started getting illustration work for Street and Smith, who was the publisher of Astounding Stories and Unknown Magazine under John W. Campbell. And he signed his work as M. Isop. <clears throat> and you might notice by some of the artwork that's sliding by here, uh, as well as doing uh, Street and Smith work, he would also do covers for paperback books. Uh, 
uh, anything from fantasy to uh, westerns, and as well as doing some artwork for the U.S. Army uh, in uh, promoting the war effort. And uh, in, in one particularly famous case, it's in the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Library, uh, his uh, beautiful poster of the fighting Filipinos there. Now, uh, in 1933, his little brother, Pagsalong, also moved from the Philippines and moved in with him in Manhattan. And he also started working for Street and Smith, doing the same kind of artwork, uh, in, 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 often in the same issues that his brother Manuel would appear in. And uh, he signed his name uh, R. Isop as opposed to M. Isop. And that led to a lot of confusion. Uh, they would often get uh, miscredited back and forth. And to this day, if you go online and you're looking for one of the other's artwork, you will often see mistakenly uh, the other brother's artwork credited to the wrong guy. So be careful out there. And that's the story behind Two Sought Adventure, Fritz Leiber's first Fafford and the Grey Mauser story. And if you want to read it and don't have access to that original unknown magazine... Uh, you can find it. You should know that it's been retitled uh, The Jewels of the Forest and uh, has been collected in a lot of anthologies and other collections and is probably most accessible in uh, Swords Against Death, which is the second uh, book in a series of five that was put out by uh, Ace Books in the early 1970s. And they all had great Jeff Jones covers, which uh, we'll probably have to talk about sometime down the line. But uh, in the meantime, I should probably just mention that Fritz Leiber is also credited. In 1961, he coined the term swords and sorcery, which then stuck and has become the name of that, sharp, that uh, subgenre uh, ever since. So there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed our uh, little look back on Fritz Leiber's very first Fafford and the Grey Mauser story. And uh, let me know in the comments down below if you are a Fafford and Grey Mauser fan or Swords and Sorcery in general. And I hope you can uh, join BookTube for February Fantasy Stories yourself. Read along or participate if you've got a BookTube channel yourself. And uh, let's, uh, let's chat a little bit about that. Now, if you follow Steve Donahue's channel, I know you've got to get going because you've got to get back to reading a distant mirror. So I'll let you go for now, but I look forward to seeing you again very soon. And until we chat again, thanks a lot.